Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to some of my favourite people and some of the world's biggest stars and people who have changed the world with music or their art, and this man certainly has. You might not necessarily know his name, but you do know Duff Duff and you do know the EastEnders theme. You also know Howard's Way and El Dorado and all those other hundreds of themes he's written. Simon May, how are you? Hi, it's nice to see you, Alex. It's really great to see you and in the flesh as well. I last saw you nearly 20 years ago on tour in Nottingham when you had the Simon May orchestra and it was one of the greatest nights in a theatre ever firstly congratulations as an event it was magnificent thank you yeah i mean it was an amazing tour um whatever the consequences of it that we may chat about later if you want to but artistically uh it was so exciting and it, it was total madness alex because we had about 15 venues and apart from my soloist singing my songs and stuff like that I also wanted Smike, my musical, to be featured in the tour. So I got about 20 schools who'd done Smike in the last couple of years, and they sent me their own choir to perform locally, whether it was Nottingham or whatever. And about four weeks before the concert tour, it was total madness. I was driving around the UK, rehearsing all these kids, different places, um, and working with the teachers and rehearsing them individually each school and then putting them together in each concert and I love that and and I've got despite the consequences of the tour um, I've got very happy memories of it and do you know what I don't regret it and I've always said that you know when when you sort of kind of are about to leave this world um, you're allowed to say I regret that I did but you are not allowed to say I regret that I didn't and wonder what would have happened if. You've had a magnificent life and career. We're going to talk through your greatest achievements and some of the hard times and the fact that as you sit here today, you're probably in the most content, happy place and successful place you've ever been. Your music will live on forever. And that is an incredible legacy. I, I'm going to ask you a very basic question about theme tunes to begin because people love this. Does it have to be simple because it has to be memorable? What is the key to a great theme tune? Great question. And I, I think that things have changed in the last recent years because end titles don't have the same profile because presenters, you know, link people, talk over the end titles. The actual visuals are squeezed over. And my analogy to that is that um, do the viewers actually want a waiter to come up to them in the restaurant when they've just had the main course and thrust the menu in their face for desserts before they've even finally digested the main course? Or do they want to savour the programme they've just seen? Why not enjoy the theme music and, and the ethos of the programme for more than 20 seconds with a, a paranoid um, link person scared that the viewers are going to hit the button and go to a different channel? I, I don't see that. So things have changed and... There isn't the same opportunity for themes to be as loved as they used to be. And, and I think now the best that a theme writer can do with a television programme is have something that's recognisable. But that's not the same as memorable. In this interview, we're going to see you by the piano recreating some of your biggest hits. And of course, the biggest of them all was EastEnders. And that really starts the beginning of your life musically. You claim you wrote that at seven, which is incredible. Yeah, tongue in cheek, of course, because in my book, I wanted chapter one to be about EastEnders and on the collection, it made sense to have EastEnders as the lead track. So slightly disingenuous of me to say that I started writing it at the age of seven. However, um, my lovely piano teacher, Anne, when I had my first piano lesson, the first thing we did, as every piano art student does, is I had to learn the, to play the scale of C major and that just goes up the scale in the same way that EastEnders does so I, you could say that I started playing EastEnders when I was seven You later write in the book that you finished it in one hour flat um, after being commissioned by the BBC and they wrote you a cheque for £100 to write that I guess at the time £100 was a lot of money and you were thrilled to have it I was thrilled to know it was going to go on a major uh, soap and the £100 was kind of neither here nor there to be honest Alex but what it meant though was that, as you know, composers and songwriters, their main source of income is performing rights. So um, it, it, it's the income, you know, people say to me, do you get paid every time uh, EastEnders is played? And I said, 
not as much as if I got paid a pound every time somebody asked me that question. <laughs> and you didn't ask me that question, bless you. No, I didn't. But in the book, you do talk about the politics of writing a song and how that's divvied up. Because I know with EastEnders particularly, it went two ways. Um, and half of it was for a man who didn't even write it. And who wasn't even in the studio. And I think it goes back to what I said a couple of moments ago. Um, do I regret that I did share the income with him? Or would I ever have to ask myself, I wonder what would have happened if I didn't and what would the consequences have been? I might not have got the gig. So Leslie was uh, an old fashioned 80 year old mm, publisher, songwriter of sorts. Uh, I don't wish to speak ill of him, but in, in hindsight, it was, um, yeah, a little bit outrageous that he felt that he could get half the royalties from something that he didn't even write a single note of. But I still don't regret it. And and there are examples that I mentioned one in my book, I think, where other writers have actually um, given away all their royalties. So um, on balance, I don't think about it too much now, and I'm, I'm very comfortable about it. Could we buy a small town with his half of the money that he made from not writing it? A small town? I'd say a city, actually. <laughs> <laughs> And that moment when you knew you'd got it, did you know it was going to be the greatest theme tune in history ever? No, absolutely not. I got a feel of it after about a week when EastEnders first came out and the crits were very, um, on balance, very favourable and excited about EastEnders. And, and what kind of gave me the first clue, I, w when I'm writing a piece of music, I have a criterion that if, after I've been in the studio, I can't let go of the melody and it haunts me in the middle of the night or whatever time of the day and it's on my playlist all of the time then I know I've cracked it but what's even greater is walking down the street or being in a supermarket which happened with these tenders and you're walking along and and you hear people whistling and humming your tune absolute strangers and you feel like going up and giving them a big hug and say well you're singing my tune <laughs> and we know the da 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 we know that bit, but the duff duff bit, how did we get around to that? Where did that inspiration come from? It was an accident, to be honest. Um, when I write a theme, even now, I try to create a long version, a three-minute version, uh, for two reasons, really, Alex. One, a three, three-and-a-half-minute version means that you can release a commercial recording of your theme. And equally importantly, it gives you the opportunity within three, three and a half minutes to take risks and explore things that you couldn't explore in the space of 30 seconds for a theme. So with my long version of EastEnders, which was the start of the journey, I had the main theme, as viewers will now know it, with a contemporary drum track, you know, that kind of thing. But then halfway through, I went into a development section and I had a bit of fun taking EastEnders back years to the Cockney times and going back to the roots of the East End and going into a kind of Cockney knees up. And that was sort of with a honky tonk piano in there and all of that yeah, stuff. Yeah, and as I describe in my book, I, I actually used to play in my father's warehouse when I was a kid and I used to play all the pianos in his warehouse and they were all out of tune and I had great fun playing sort of kind of Winifred Atwell and Russ Conway kind of tunes. Does that date me, by the way? Yes. <laughs> Don't answer that question, Alex. But I did all of that. And, and when I was doing the Cockney section in EastEnders, um, it made sense to just go back in time. The problem was, of course, that I wanted to go full circle and go into the end titles and come back into the more contemporary feel. So I realised during the session that the only way to go back to a completely different feel and tempo would be to create a musical distraction. Uh, Graham Broad, magic drummer who, who was on the session, I said, Graham, what we need is a drum fill that distracts the listener. Uh, so here, here we go, let's take the EastEnders hook. And put that in between the Cockney section and the end titles. And I, I'm slightly reinventing history here, but as, as I'd like to recall it, what actually happened was that just as Neil, the engineer, was mixing the whole track, and you know when you're an engineer, you, 
you take each different instrument and work on it separately before putting the final mix together. And as Julia and Tony, the producers, came into the studio, he was working on that tom fill and he's putting echoes and sound effects on it. And as they came into the studio, all they could hear was. Dum, 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 dum. I said, Simon May, you're a genius. That is so good for the end titles. <laughs> <laughs> and did you realise that that would be the thing that every actor in that soap looks forward to? If they get the last line before your drum beat, they've made it. Yeah. Uh, do you remember when you were at school and you wrote essays and when your teacher gave you your essay back, you, if, if you were in the sixth form, which you sound very educated, Alex, so you must have been. <laughs> so you got your essay back and the first thing you did was go to the end and just see if you got an alpha, beta or gamma. You didn't worry about the teacher's comments. And the same happens with all these EastEnders cast. When they get their script, the first thing they do, and Shane Ritchie has told me this, uh, they all go to the last page of the script to see if they've got the doof doof. Do you think the BBC's been respectful of you and your tune? Do you feel like it's had the respect it deserves? Because there is an argument that without that great theme tune, the show could have flopped because it was the first thing you saw and it's the last thing that you remember. And all comedians will tell you the beginning and the end is very, very important. Yes, yeah, what's on the box and, and it's a very kind comment you make. But to be honest, um, if EastEnders hadn't been such a well-made, written, directed, acted... Um, drama series we probably wouldn't be talking about EastEnders now we might be talking about El Dorado which actually as a theme I actually quite like almost as much as EastEnders uh, and in answer to your question the Beeb have been fantastic to me they've they've <clears throat> well for example they invited me to go to in February and that's when we last spoke to the EastEnders live um, recording and the party afterwards and I had the thrill of catching up with all my friends in the cast and meeting new friends from the cast so yeah they have been respectful and and whenever this space they've they've given me a credit at the end of the program especially on Sundays and and the long episodes when they've got more time for credits and when presentation aren't talking over them <laughs> so yeah I, I I've they've treated me very well Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. We're here in the gorgeous surroundings of the grand staircase of the St. Pancras Hotel, and we're here with a man who is a genius. He's the man who wrote Howard's Way and El Dorado and EastEnders, and he is Simon May. How are you? I'm great, and I'm so excited to be with this grand piano, Alex. It looks awesome. It is beautiful, it isn't it? I've just had a little tweak, and it sounds fantastic. And the um, thing is, it reminds me, when I had my first piano lesson when I was seven years old, I uh, had a fabulous, pretty piano teacher who I fell in love with, called Anne. And thanks to her, I actually started writing the EastEnders theme when I was seven years old with her, because you know what it's like when you're playing scales? You sometimes make a mistake or two. Whoops. And that led What a great grand piano, eh? 
and there you go you just heard EastEnders let's talk musically how you come up with that so we start by going up the scale the middle section is very different how did you think of it yeah you say going up the, the scale Alex the way I normally write a piece of music is I might have a drum track going as I did with EastEnders and then I kind of come up with a chord sequence that, that kicks me in the, I mean the chord sequence for, for EastEnders was um, Very, very simple C E minor F G, and then when I've got the chord sequence recorded, I just let my fingers wander all over the keyboard, and so while those chords are going on, I just sort of my fingers wandered sort of. That's the chords in the left hand, and the original tune I did on tape one at home was not was. strong and and when I've got students and I'm trying to explain to them the importance of a passing note you would expect that melody to go well I mean that's pretty obvious but I actually made a mistake and instead of going I hit the C instead of the D and I went and I had to resolve the passing note and that's a better tune actually, isn't it? And the other thing that happened accidentally was uh, my middle eight that gets played on the omnibus. I originally had eight bars instead of four. I, it was... Um... It just went on too long. So the producer said, Julian Tony said, actually it's too long make it shorter so instead of eight bars it just went a, a brilliant example of less is, can be more what a fabulous legacy though everybody can sing it everybody knows it yeah um yeah i'm, I'm privileged and proud to know that Why did you choose theme tunes and not pop music? Did this choose you, do you think? It's such a hard question to answer. I've, I have always believed that the good stuff that happens to our lives is not of our creation, it's destiny and it was meant to be. And yeah, I, I, I enjoyed writing hit songs on Crossroads and all of that, but I, I seem to have been branded, uh, and I use that word in a positive way, as as opposed to a cow he's just had a bit of hot metal <laughs> thrust on his coat um branding is is a good thing and and my branding is i write television themes and film music but uh, you know i have had a number one hit song in england in the uk uh of which i'm proud so i, I i'm not quite sure what i'm going to put on my gravestone well it won't be me who puts it alex but um <laughs> I think probably a husband, um, father, brother, um, songwriter, um, composer. There's not going to be enough room on that stone, actually, is there? On the back of TV shows, you've had such mega hits. Anita Dobson, I mean, has got a lot to thank you for, and she does. And you thank her. Kate Robbins, you had another song. They all seem to be tied to TV. It's like it was meant to be. It's an alchemy, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, there are two Simons who worked out the power of television. Dear Simon Cowell's one, and I, I'd like to think I'm the other. And I was actually there before him. I realised at a very early stage that to get a hit record, you either had to make the radio playlists and go with the flow. And that that's probably the most natural way to proceed. But the other way is to create a song that gets exposure on television. And if it's in an emotional and dramatic context, that is what makes people want to make that song part of their lives. What I love is how you got on the radio. There's some great stories in the book, which is called Duff Duff. It's out uh, in a few weeks' time. You can get it on Amazon. A man called Tony Fish, I've heard of in the past, stories of, and he dismissed you out of hand initially. Suddenly you get a hit, and then he's phoning you asking for the record. And tell me what you told him, because it's a great story. Tony was a, a good friend of mine. I used to teach him at Kingston Grammar School. And after he left Kingston Grammar School, we kept in touch and he had a, he started off working at Radio One 
uh, before he became a very successful manager of BBC local radio stations. And I can remember in 1974, when Born With A Smile came out and was featured heavily on Crossroads, before it started happening on, on TV, the record was released and the promo copies were sent out. And naturally, I phoned up Tony and said, Tony, um, any chance of a spin of Born With A Smile On My Face on Radio 1, please? Can you, can you get a new spin or something? And Tony said down the phone, sigh, that will never get played on Radio 1. So a couple of weeks later, after it had been featured on Crossroads, it, it leapt into the charts 14 and then number two. And I got this phone call from Tony and he said, um, Simon, we actually haven't got a copy of Born With A Smile On My Face and we need it for the chart rundown. Can you send me over a copy? And I said, Tony, go and buy one. I love that. I love it because it, that is, sums up the business, really, doesn't it? When people make up their own mind and suddenly they'll jump on the bandwagon and change their opinion totally. Yeah, I mean, Tony took that as a joke, but I still didn't send him a record, so <laughs> I don't know how he got a copy. Good for you. What I also love are the people that you've worked with. I mean, names that stick out to me. Uh, let's go through a few of them. Bob Monkhouse, I know you were hugely fond of, and what a turn he was. He was a very clever man, and whenever I do after dinner talks which isn't very often but whenever I do I always kind of use him as my hero and, and template because when Bob Monkhouse came up with an ad lib it was totally rehearsed scripted and perfected and and I think I said to you at the, at the beginning of our lovely get together this afternoon it's either take one or take hundred so you can do an ad lib answer and it works off the cuff the first time or else you have to perfect it uh, and when Bob Monkhouse used to do his corporate or after dinner entertainments, I know as a fact that the organisers of that event would send him a, a profile of all the guests and Bob would go off and spend a couple of days learning the history and names of all of the guests. So when he was ad-libbing and talking, every person at that dinner or, or event would think that Bob knew, knew them personally which he probably did for 24 hours. <laughs> so clever, isn't it? And Cliff Richard as well is another one you talk about a lot in the book. For 75 years, he has been at the top of his game and he's back still doing these huge venues and his punters love him. Yep, and um, I feel very privileged that Cliff recorded one of my songs that I, I co-wrote with Mike Reed, my mate, uh, for the Trainer series. And um, after Cliff had recorded More to Life, which Plug Plug is on the album, by the way, on the triple album, uh, I, I can remember Cliff invited us to the Wimbledon studio to let us hear his new version of More to Life. Uh, and it, it was so special for me because ever since being a young teenager, I had always, you know, been a hero worshipper of Cliff. I took my first girlfriend to see Summer Holiday. And so actually to be in a studio and hear this icon's voice singing one of your songs. I can't describe to you how... how I mean, anybody younger listening to this may not be such a passionate fan of Cliff, but trust me, he, he will last on gold radio in 50 years' time. He will outlive a lot of the uh, ethereal young singers. Not all of them, but he's an icon. And again, the connection between him and Princess Diana, and that's in the book as well. Another remarkable connection. Amazing, because after we had listened to Cliff singing More to Life on the, on, on the master recording, Cliff invited us out for an Indian with, with, with the studio and everything. And Rosie and I um, joined for that Indian. And Mike Reed, who'd written a song with me, uh, said, Rosie, um, I've been asked to go skiing with Cliff, but I've got something I can't get out of. Do you fancy taking my place? And my dear wife is never averse to going on holiday so she she said yeah i'd love to do that so rosie joined cliff and his party in lek and at the same time coincidentally princess diana and her two youngsters at the time were skiing and diana invited cliff to go for dinner in lek sadly her father Earl spencer had a sudden illness and diana had to go back to the uk but after that um charles who was also on that skiing party invited a, a very select party of 16 of us to go to his home in Barnes and have dinner with Cliff and Diana whoa I mean that is that is something to brag about to your grandchildren and um, I, I can remember 
I've always been a bit starstruck, Alex, and, and when I meet somebody really famous like Diana or, or the Queen or whoever, God, that was a name drop. But yes, I have. And whenever I meet these, you know, icons, I freeze. I, d I just don't know what to say. Well, there's levels of showbiz, isn't there? There's Cliff, who is up there with the best, and then there's yeah. Diana, which is echelons above that. Yeah, yeah. And, and what was fantastic about that evening was after, after dinner, we went into the lounge. It was winter time, and, and there was a lovely lounge fire. And the 16 of us, that's Diana, her ladies-in-waiting, and Ken Wolfe, her bodyguard, and Mike Reed, and, and, and Rosie and I, and a couple of other friends, and Charles, we sat down, and Cliff and Mike Reed played guitar and we had a rendition, especially for Diana, of Travelling Light, Move It, Summer Holiday and all of that stuff. And I always think that if EMI Records had been in that room and recorded it live, that would have been the best-selling album of the decade. Cliff Sings to Diana. How do you know what to say to someone when they're that famous? I mean, Diana was in a league of her own. How did you know how to behave and what did you say? Well, I've, I've always been clumsy with words. Uh, and, and the fact is, I don't know what to say and I, I often make a fool of myself. And to go off at a slight tangent before answering your question, um, in chapter two of my book, um, and I hope you don't mind me quoting it, but it, it, it illustrates how clumsy I am with words and I do make a fool of myself and um, Howard's Way was nominated as the best theme of the year for the television and radio industry awards it wasn't like opening an, an envelope it was a done deal so I knew I had to make an acceptance speech so I sort of worked hard at a very short kind of speech and when we were at the Grosvenor um, and I was just about to accept my award from I think it was David Frost, or, or it could have been Bob, Bob Monkhouse, actually. I'd prepared my acceptance speech, and it was all very cool. Like, I'd like to thank my producer, Jerry Glaster, um, who's given me the opportunity to write themes for his very successful drama series. And without Jerry's faith in me, I, I wouldn't have had the opportunity of enjoying my career, bringing up my kids and supporting my wife. And so, Jerry, thank you very much. That was the rehearsed speech. But I got so nervous that when I received the award all I could do was blurt out I'd like to thank my producer Jerry without whom it would not have been possible for my wife and I to have children <laughs> I Daisy my daughter does not believe that I said that but I swear I did in front of a thousand people at the Grown House Hotel and everybody just fell about I mean and I I, I heard this gale of laughter I said that what have I said yes. <laughs> They're the worst moments, aren't they? And then we look at your career generally, and it has been hugely successful, but then there are moments where you get so successful. I notice you refer to um, your ego and personality in one of the later chapters in the book, and it is easy to get carried away with yourself, and I think that was probably around the time you decided to take the Simon May Orchestra on tour, and that was probably one of the most defining moments of your life because it proves you can put everything on the line and you can lose even when you're at the top of your game. Yeah, um, I don't regret that I did it. Um, like I said, you know, when you review your life, you're not allowed to say, I wonder what would have happened if. Uh, so I, one morning, when Rosie came back from shopping, I said, by the way, I've just booked 14 concert halls to go on tour and I'm just about to book the orchestra and the, and the sound system. It'll cost a few thousand pounds, but I promise you we won't, lose our home because of this I've worked out what the figures are and the worst scenario is that we lose a few thousand pounds and it'll be good for my career but I was so wrong I, I got the figures completely badly projected and the net result was that the concert tour lost a fortune uh, the banks closed in like sharks as they do we had to sell our lovely home and we left our cottage in East Horsley and had to rent another cottage house in East Horsley. But there is a kind of part two of that whole story, Alex, and it's really important that I remember that because it was sad and, you know, regrettable that I made a bad decision, but I learned from it. And as the years progressed, I had to fight back. And, and I had to build up again, and I did. And um, every loser wins. 
I want to talk about that moment when you realised that it was all over. I mean, you cancelled two shows because you knew they weren't going to sell. I saw you on that tour and I saw you in a venue that did sell. In fact, it sold out. But I guess the cost of touring an orchestra is so extortionate. And then for the venues that didn't sell, that was the difficulty, was it? Yeah, and and I think there is a difference, and I've learned this, between self-belief and self-delusion. And I was deluded to think that just because I'd written some successful music, loads of people were, you know, I'm not exactly um, <clears throat> Justin Bieber, and so you're not going to pack out the concert halls. But what that concert tour taught me was, firstly, get your budgets right, look at everything practically, secondly, sleep on a decision before you move forward, and thirdly, um, just add a touch of humility to your life and, and the arrogance that I, I was feeling then as, as a relatively young and yeah, successful composer has to be matched by a sense of reality and, and I think um, there's a lovely line in a musical Rip Van Winkle that I wrote and uh, the, the line is basically when Rick is singing and he sings um, with my head in the clouds and my feet on the ground you're allowed to be free and and that kind of sums up my life I, th I think that even though difficult stuff has challenged my life that still hasn't stopped me having a vision and 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 an, an aspiration to do things I mean for goodness sake a year ago I said to my family do you know what I'm gonna write my autobiography and they fell about laughing and said dad who's gonna read your autobiography you, just because you wrote EastEnders and Howard's Way um give us a break I said no I'm, I'm gonna have a go and here we are <clears throat> me pinching myself because the autobiography is out with a record collection and so that kind of um, visualization that 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 desire to do something which takes you out of your comfort zone I've never lost that but I have tempered it with I hope you agree that I, I come across to you, Alex, as a reasonably balanced person who's, who's not sort of head in the clouds. Right, but I think you're also being too humble. You say who would turn up to hear the EastEnders theme tune. A lot of people love it, and to see the guy who created it with a big orchestra, actually, I was more than happy to pay for it, and many people did. It was just maybe a bad time, maybe too big of venues and all of that. Um, let's talk about the, the rebuilding your life. How long did that take? It took longer than I would have wished, but I had a lucky break because um, Ray Thompson, who was working on Howard's Way earlier, invited me to a meeting and said, I'm doing a, a major series in New Zealand and it's a film series with um, the adventures of Enid Blyton. Um, I'd like you to compose all the music for it. And so I got really stuck in. Um, there was a song, I'll Always Stand By You, that I used as the theme song for the series. and. I'm going off at a slight tangent here, Alex, but I, I love writing a song with lyrics that has more than one application. And although I'll Always Stand By You is all about the relationship of the four kids in Eden Brighton, it was also um, talking about the fact that my dear wife Rosie stood by me when we were hitting the rocks and having a difficult time and lo losing our home. And what happened was that that Enid Blyton series was shown all over the world, about 115 different countries, and it was very successful. So were the follow-up series. So within about two or three years, I was back on track. And again, I guess the moral to this story is is owning your own material. I hear this from every legend anywhere in the world, from Howard Stern on the radio to Elton John to any of these people, you have to own your own material because the minute you give it away, you can't make money out of it and it's going to make other people very rich. Absolutely. Copyright is king. Yeah. And if only you could have told yourself that 30 years ago, you probably would have been an even wealthier man than you are sat here. Right? Yeah, I wish somebody had told me that 30 years ago. And I'm hoping, actually, that any young people listening to us having this chat um, not just for commercial reasons because I want to sell loads of books but there is a whole section at the end of my life in music which has my top 10 tips and advice for young writers who want to make it in the industry and uh, yeah I would say this wouldn't I but I honestly believe that all of those years of experience have been channeled into the book so when somebody says to me how long did it take you to write Duff Duff the answer is probably longer than one year 
And in summary, at the end of the book, what we learn is that none of it really matters as long as you've got family, because whilst they're supporting you, you can get through anything. Without them, you're going to struggle. Absolutely. And um, I, I had a delightful get together with a hundred young pupils uh, at a school in Somerset last year and we were doing a SMIKE seminar and at the end of the day um, they arranged a, a Q&A questions and answers session where all the kids were allowed to you know to ask me any questions no holds barred and towards the end of the session this fabulous 10 year old boy put his hand up and said Simon how rich are you and uh, all the teachers in the room thought, whoa, that's a bit of a direct question. Uh, is Simon going to answer it? And I said, yeah, sure. The answer to your question is, I'm the richest person in the world. And there was an intake of breath from all these hundred kids and the teachers thinking, no, nah, this can't be. And they waited for me to expand on that. And I said, yeah, I said, I have got the loveliest wife, the loveliest four children and two son-in-laws that anybody could wish for. Yep, I'm the luckiest and... Uh, richest person in the world. It's a beautiful way to end the interview. Duff Duff is the new autobiography and it comes with a triple CD as well, which is great. So we learn about your life in words and of course the music which illustrates it so beautifully. You have literally created the soundtrack to our lives via El Dorado, The Good, The Bad, The Brilliant, The East Enders, The Howard's Ways. Um, these tunes are, are so anthemic and I hope you know that you've brought much joy to many people. Thank you for saying that and... and um there's no kind of way of answering that without sounding either mo modest or big-headed. So thank you for the comment, Alex. Simon May, thank you so much for your time. The new book is available now. You can see the link at the bottom of Celebrity Radio and go to Amazon, put in Duff Duff, and it's there. Good to talk to you. Cheers, Alex. Thanks very much. And of course, EastEnders wasn't your only big hit. You also had Howard's Way, which I know many, many people love just as much. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Uh, and it was, in fact, my mother's favourite theme that I ever wrote, so it's got special memories for me. Do you like me to play it? I'd love to hear it. Here we go. Mm -hmm. 